Yeah, yeah, because you have this, so you have to push it hard and then we will go in. But I'm not sure I can push this in without pushing that out. Although, if no one's using that. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, it's No worries, I don't care. Electricity is important in our business. <laughs> no, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> I move to the paper again. I, because then I start getting distracted by the stuff that is happening in the machine and it doesn't work like Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, true. You lose that. Good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, 2019 uh, meeting of the IGF Coalition on Platform Responsibility. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in the, to celebrate the fifth anniversary of our coalition with you guys. Uh, my name is Luca Belli, I'm Professor of Internet Governance and Regulation at FGV Law School and together with my partner in crime, Nicolo Zingales, I have the pleasure to co-chair this coalition since five years. Uh, it's very interesting for us to see that uh, despite all the critiques that one may rightfully uh, do to the IGF uh, being a talking shop and not having concrete outputs, we actually demonstrate with uh, concrete evidence that th this is not completely true. Uh, the, this special issue that you may have, you may find there and also available uh, online, thanks to also Elsevier that has agreed to keep it open, uh, in open access for one year, uh, demonstrates that actually when people uh, gather and analyze uh, things together, uh, they may have concrete uh, results, they may produce uh, concrete research, inputs and outputs, and 
but also concrete policy suggestions. So before we start, and we give the floor to our uh, distinguished panelists, and of course, of course to Nico that uh, has uh, had the, the burden of organizing the, the uh, session and therefore needs a lot of, uh, well, not a lot, but some time to <laughs> provide some thoughts on, uh, on the work that we are, have been doing. Before that, I just wanted to uh, give you an idea, uh, again, to demonstrate that the IGF is not only about uh, talking, it's also about doing things. We have started five years ago to demonstrate that platform as a responsibility to respect fundamental rights, and that is why we coined the term platform responsibility that now is uh, also utilized by other people, not always quoting us, but <laughs> who cares? The, what, what matters is to uh, progress in, in thinking. And the, the, after some months of work, actually, we have understood that we needed a common understanding of how platform could respect human rights, we elaborated the recommendations on terms of service and terms of service, sorry, and human rights in 2015. Those recommendations were also appended to a study on terms of service and human rights that was co-sponsored by the Council of Europe and FGV. And many of those elements in the recommendations may be seen in the recommendation 2018 number two of the Council of Europe on the roles and responsibilities of intermediaries. So uh, again. A, another further evidence to uh, support the claim that actually the IGF can do things to influence policy making. Uh, then we published uh, two years ago a book on platform regulations and what emerged from, from that research, uh, the, book, the name of the book was Platform Regulations, How Platforms Are Regulated and How They Regulate Us. The second part of the title is the most interesting, uh, of course, because what emerged from the uh, research and the debate we had together is that platforms are acquiring a role of private regulators. They define unilaterally uh, conditions in terms of service that regulate how users behave. They implement them uh, through algorithmic tools and by defining the architecture of the platform. And they can also uh, judge how conflicts, how disputes are, are solved between users according to the terms that they establish. So they have a quasi-normative, quasi-executive, and quasi-judicial power. And that is very interesting uh, for us, but and that is the consideration that then has triggered our final uh, step in our work, our not final, but last, the last one, uh, is the consideration of what are the values that are conveyed by those private regulators and what value is extracted. We know that public regulators are bound by constitutional law. They have to respect fundamental rights. They have to promote competition. How are, pi how are private regulators behaving and what are the values that they are conveying and then they are baking into their architectures and how they are extracting value? Perfect. Thank you very much, Luca, um, for this in the introduction. So, um, again, my name is Nicolò Zingales from University of Leeds, and uh, I've had the pleasure of um, uh, participating in the discussion of this DCPR over the last five years. And I think this is um, a moment that we uh, should recognize uh, that we have come a long way. Uh, so we have managed to uh, identify different notions of responsibility in our work. And at this point, I think uh, uh, what we asked ourselves, as Luca pointed out, is uh, how can we um, make sure that when regulators uh, operate in a private sphere, uh, they will be um, enlightened by a notion of value that all of us understand and appreciate uh, as the one that should be guiding this uh, private regulatory sphere. Um, so in doing that, we have tried to connect two notions of value that are particularly important. Um, so on the one hand, uh, the economic value. So uh, who is getting value out of the operations on the platforms? Uh, how much of this value is being created? And how much is it extraction of value from other players that are somehow uh, stuck in the ecosystem? Uh, and on the other hand, uh, 
social value, so uh, values uh, like uh, democracy, uh, the respect of fundamental rights, uh, you know, but even labor protection, environmental protections. Uh, so how can we make sure that uh, the operation of uh, private entities uh, fits in a framework where uh, the pursuit of one value does not um, undermine the system of guarantees that we had in place for the other value, so the social and the economic dimensions are harmonious and they're not uh, clashing against each other. So in this uh, special issue, we have tried to highlight the linkage between these two. Uh, there is often uh, insufficient recognition for the economic spillover uh, of uh, certain types of regulation that is being proposed, in particular with regard to platforms, but also by platforms themselves. And um, I think in the economic sphere, we have seen a lot of focus on um, economic-driven um, responsibility. Uh, so the, the fact that the more a company has market power, uh, the more uh, the responsibility arises to make sure that competition is not distorted. So we have started exploring the extent to which this should have a role to play also with regard to human rights protection. So how much can we have asymmetric regulation playing out uh, also with regard to the respect of fundamental rights. Um, and I think if we don't uh, emphasize this linkage, we fall into um, the law of unintended consequences. So quite often we uh, impose some regulation that has a minimum uh, floor uh, where the, everyone needs to respect it. And by doing that, we kind of uh, advantage, make, uh, give an advantage to certain players which are uh, better suited to uh, comply with the regulation and uh, we basically uh, hinder the ability of uh, smaller players to um, compete on an equal footing. So I think uh, in the contribution that we are going to uh, hear today, uh, we are going to analyze different forms of values and uh, I think for our discussion, it would be useful to maybe at the end reflect upon uh, how can we make sure that the value that is conveyed in the social sphere uh, is in line and is harmonically uh, developed in conjunction with uh, the, our need to protect fundamental rights and uh, other social values. Um, so we have uh, three wonderful um, interventions that will alight um, the notion of value from a fundamental rights perspective. Uh, we had also in the special issue some discussion about uh, taxation uh, that is not going to be uh, discussed today, but obviously there's a lot of issues also with regard to uh, making sure that uh, the allocation of uh, uh, benefits uh, is distributed <laughs> evenly in the economy, so taxation plays a special role in that regard, and platforms both tend to ev evade the uh, traditional understanding of uh, taxation based on presence, but also um, they are a very powerful tool to make sure that the users uh, will pay the taxes for the activities on the platform. So that's a discussion that we are not going to uh, go in depth to, uh, today, but um, we are going to start with um, a keynote speech uh, by Edison Lanza, who is the special rapporteur on uh, freedom of expression for the uh, American Court, uh, Inter American uh, Commission of Human Rights. Um, and so Alison will uh, introduce us to the notion of value from a freedom of expression perspective, and then we'll have some reaction by um, other panelists that I will introduce as we follow along. Hey, good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the Luca, Nico, and the, the Dynamic Coalition for, for this invitation. Uh, yes, in, in fact, in, in in the, in the freedom of expression perspective, I want to say that uh, the, the, the content of the moderation by the platform is perhaps the most controversial issue now actually in, in the human rights field, in, in, in particular in the case of freedom of expression. Uh, traditional, uh, historically, uh, in, under the international law, we, the, we agree that the, 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 the states um, are the, 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 the principal obligation, have the principal obligation to respect human rights and to enforce uh, and implement, implemented, uh, you know, the recommendation of the international 
standards of international bodies. But uh, in the last uh, five, six years, uh, in particular, the Special Rapporteurs of Freedom of Expression in UN, the OCE, and the, uh, my, my, my office in the Inter-American System, and also the, 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 the African Commission of Human Rights, we agree that the, the rise of the power of uh, the uh, from the, the companies, the tech companies that, uh, you know, control the platform and the public space, and, uh, you know, uh, through the, the norm of the platforms, uh, the, the terms of, of condition and, and the decision making that, the, in fact, the platform uh, does uh, adopted, uh, where it now is sharpening uh, the, the, you know, the, the scope the, and the uh, and, and the guarantees for from the exercise of freedom of expression. Uh, we recognize also that uh, it's not only a responsibility from this company. Uh, in, in the one hand, the, the state take uh, action and uh, you know pass. Uh, laws and decision to press to uh, the the platform to adopt uh, this uh, you know a content decision and take down like uh, one copyright uh, uh, hate speech and uh, um, take down in, in different uh, under different scope uh, and and in the other hand the the, the, the platform take decision by own uh, term of, of condition. And, and also the civil society and uh, you know the, the societies in general uh, call for the platform to take decision in some issues that the rights concern like terrorism, violence, uh, violence against we, uh, women and, and vulnerably, vulnerably groups. Uh, and well, this is a, a very complex situation in, in this case. Um, in fact, in the, in the last we have a, a joint declaration, each A, uh, that released um, on May, in the day of the freedom of expression. And I, I want to, uh, to share with all of you the, the last um, decision that we adopted in this, in this sense. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the 20th 20, the 20, uh, declaration of uh, the, the special reporters. Uh, and we divide the, you know, the risk and the, uh, challenges for freedom of expression to the ten ne next ten years in three chapters. Uh, the first have relation with the creation of the environment that uh, enabled the exercise of freedom of expression in safety manners, and, and this uh, have a, a, a link with you know the violence against journalists and the criminalization of expression and traditional issues. Uh, the second one it's building a, a maintain a free and open and inclusive internet that many many issues is discussed here in the IGF uh, linked well, well the, the, the infrastructure the net neutrality uh, and ensure the, the, the universal access for, for internet and final first time in this 20s uh, joint declaration uh, we call the private uh, control as a threat to freedom of expression. And first time we adopted some uh, special recommendation uh, from, from the, the, the platform, uh, adopted in, you know, in fact, uh, given that uh, the UN system uh, adopted the, the, the rule of, uh, that the companies also have the uh, duty to respect human rights, in the directive of uh, business and human rights, um, and and when I, I I try to to have a set of this uh, recommendation very quick, um, but uh, in order to protect uh, against the accountable private uh, private uh, domini domination of the environment of freedom of expression, we urge uh, to de develop the following uh, recommendation. Um, first, um, the, the creation of independent and multi-stakeholder oversight, transparency, and uh, accountability mechanism to address private content rules. Uh, second, the regulatory measures that address the ways in which the advertising depend uh, business models of some di digital technology companies create an environment which can also be used for a viral dissemination of, of uh, this misinformation and hateful expression. Uh, third, uh, the company uh, should be co implementation 
the responsibility under the UN Guide Principles of, uh, on Business and Human Rights, uh, for uh, legal and technological solutions that uh, allow for transparent algorithmic curation and moderation of content, uh, and finally, uh, human rights sensitive solution to the challenges caused by disinformation include the growing possibility of the deep fakes and, and, and the new phenomena of uh, uh, polarization. And, uh, and finally, and very important at least, uh, take effective rules and systems to address in relation to uh, companies providing digital communication service and their uh, concentration of ownership and practice which represent an abuse of the, the dominant market uh, position, you know, the link uh, between economic and, and, and human rights values. And, and, and in, in, in the scope of this uh, resolution, we call also to, to have, you know, a system to, up, uh, to appeal the, the, the decision of content moderation and uh, in, 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 in some way to generate a, a jurisprudence about the takedowns and the decision uh, in, in, in transparent manner to discuss in, in, in multi-stakeholder space like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Addison. Uh, that's, um, perfect introduction also reminding us of the importance of uh, procedural values there, so appeal, uh, transparency, uh, and I think this ties in uh, very well with the um, speech by uh, Nicola Suzor, who is a, um, a professor at uh, Queensland University of Technology in Australia. Uh, so he just, we invited him because he just published a very thoughtful book on content moderation practices that is especially uh, looks into what are the values that inform content moderation. And this will be a theme that will be explored in this workshop, but more broadly, I think this uh, ties in with our question about what are the values. Uh, the approach that we would like to propose is, first, we understand what the values are, so those that have been listed uh, by the special rapporteurs in the declaration are a good uh, ground uh, to start this inquiry. And then, once we understand what the values are and whether they are created or extracted or conveyed, you know, then we can think about how to uh, shape regulation in a way that recognizes the production of value. So, uh, Nicolas, the floor to you. Thank you, Nico, for the warm introduction and the, the opportunity to, uh, to, to plug the book. Uh, the book is called Lawless, The Secret Rules That Govern Our Digital World. It is available uh, free online. I'm happy to share a PDF or you can get it from my Twitter page. Um, thank you. But in more seriousness, um, I'm really grateful to be here at the Dynamic Coalition and see such a full room to, of, of people who are interested in this question of how we operationalize values in the uh, governance of the internet, at, particularly at a platform level. I think what's really interesting of being here at the IGF, being here in Europe, is that it's clear that we're at a moment of real opportunity for change in how we embed human rights values and due process um, safeguards in the way that decisions are made about content online. Clearly, states are much more willing to intervene in the past, and there's a moment, there's a lot of uh, new laws about new content guidelines and new uh, structures to actually require platforms to take a more active role, and those have to be very carefully designed to pr pr ensure that they continue to um, protect human rights values. Platforms themselves are facing a, a moment of, uh, of crisis, a, a crisis of legitimacy in that the way that they have governed their networks in the past is no longer often considered sufficient to account for the real impact that they have on fundamental human rights. And I think that means that platforms are now more willing uh, than they ever have been before to enter into this discussion about how they might embed new procedural safeguards and substantive protections for rights into their networks. 
and civil society. Um, we're seeing civil society become a lot more organized in the way that we develop the um, or articulate the values that we want to see in internet governance and to try to take on the next step of figuring out how we put that into practice. So the fundamental argument um, of my book and my talk today is that there is an opportunity here to constitutionalize, to develop real procedural and substantive safeguards for how platforms deal with the expression of their users. I think that's fundamentally important and it's a, it's a time now that we can reflect on the progress we've made to date and then think together as a multi-stakeholder community uh, about how we might move forward. So a couple of key points here. Um, First is that platforms are always going to have a key role in governing online content. Regardless of the laws that we create, there is always going to be both a zone of discretion where platforms are free to create and enforce their own terms of service and safeguards. And then when interpreting public rules, there's going to be uh, discretion and obligations on platforms to be able to apply those democratically developed rules to their particular circumstances. And so I think what we need to push for here as we start moving forward to operationalize the values that are represented in this, um, in this great special issue um, is to think about how you do due process in a way that can be operationalized at scale by private platforms. Clearly, I think the old institutions that we have to safeguard due process, the courts and the, uh, and the civil society apparatus that accompany them, are not quite currently suited to doing that day-to-day -day work of accountability that ensures that decisions are made in a way that is legitimate. I think really I want to close on two key avenues for collaboration. Um, now, when we have all of, all of us together here in this room, thinking about when we leave the IGF, where we might work together next. The first question is, how do we take the high-level values that exist and proliferate in all of these declarations about rights, um, new ones released today by the web, or this week by the Web We Want Foundation, uh, the, the, but uh, continuing a, a long history of what you can think of as digital constitutionalism documents. Uh, documents that articulate the principles that we want to see, not just binding on states, but we want to see platforms adhere to when they're making decisions that affect individuals. And so there's a lot, lot of work to be done here on working out how to translate those high level values into more concrete uh, either rules, legal, well, with real legal binding force, or um, self-regulatory processes that help to hold companies to account. The second is then figuring out how civil society organisations can work to do that accountability work. I think that we need a better institutional process that we can actually monitor how well platforms are performing against those high level values and hold them to account against basic human rights. I think that means a lot more access to data and new methodologies that we can use to track performance over time at scale across platforms. And there's a lot of work for researchers here to do that, but then a lot of work for civil society to take that research and to put it into practice in a way that can actually move us from transparency to, towards real accountability. And so two quick plugs as I finish. Um, first is the International Communications Association uh, post, um, post conference on platform governance. If anyone wants to come to Brisbane in May, it's beautiful, we can go to the Gold Coast. Um, the call for papers is out now and closes on the 20th of December. And that's a chance for us to think through when, how to implement regulation and when self-regulation can work effectively. Uh, and second, the Santa Clara principles on transparency and accountability on content moderation are entering a review phase next year. We encourage everyone here to get involved in that process as we start to work out exactly how we do this work of holding platforms accountable against um, public interest values in a way that protects innovation, 
protects freedom of speech and protects everything that we care about. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, applause. Uh, we'll take some questions at the end of this session. Um, First, uh, before moving to the next uh, set of speakers, I, I would like to thank also uh, Monica uh, Rosina uh, Giza from Facebook, uh, who you know is an, a very important player in this discussion, and uh, it's a company that definitely has been uh, thinking uh, a lot over the past year or or more even about uh, mechanisms for oversight and accountability. Uh, so we hope that uh, you can tell us something about uh, this initiative. Well, first of all, thank you, everyone, um, especially Luca and Nicolo, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so my name is Monica. I've been working at Facebook Brazil for a little over three years now. Um, and we have very few minutes to talk, so I'm just going to um, highlight um, what I want to say in three main points. <laughs> Um, so over my um, past three years at Facebook, I have really, really been able to witness a um, pretty amazing shift towards how the company um, looks at content issues, not only content issues, but because this is the, the focus of this panel, I'm going to focus on content, um, in terms of value um, and also in terms of accountability. Um, so the first point I'd like to make is um, transparency. Um, the company has really, really worked um, towards the last couple of years towards becoming more transparent. Um, our community standards um, have very easy, very accessible language. Um, they are available online um, in depth for those who want to research and learn about it further. Um, these are um, standards and internal policies that are constantly evolving, um, and we've been working really hard to make that process transparent as well. Um, you are now able to um, hear about all of the internal discussions that we have at Facebook regarding content and content regulation because we publish minutes of every meeting that takes place and that reflects on um, on policy changes. Um, we've been consulting with experts on the ground and that includes academics, civil society members, uh, people from specific communities, um, and that's taken into account into every single um, decision that we make in the company. So for those of you who are um, more interested in this sphere, I welcome you to learn a little bit more about the process and, and to understand and to visit our minutes. Um, a second point I'd like to make is um, in terms of values. Um, you now see um, human rights, um, fundamental values embedded in Facebook's approach, especially towards um, content moderation. Um, so one example that I one of many examples that I'd like to bring up today is the latest update that we did to the values that guide our community standards that was published uh, in, you find that on Facebook's newsroom page that was published on September 12th, and it's a post by our Vice President of Global Policy Management, Monica Bickert, and um, it, it really just updates um, the values that Facebook um, holds itself accountable to in terms of, and that guide our community standards, um, in terms of, first of all, commitment to free expression. That really, commitment to free speech really guides uh, Facebook's um, approach towards this. And, you know, we're, this is a very explicit and specific text that recognizes that the internet does bring new and increased opportunities for abuse. And whenever Facebook needs to act to limit free expression, then it will guide itself, um, you know, um, on principles such as authenticity, safety, safety is number one nowadays at the company. Um, privacy and also dignity. And then just one thing I'd like to highlight on, on the dignity piece, you'll find human rights language embedded in the language of our own updates to our community standards, such as 
Um, we believe that all people are equal in dignity and rights, and we expect that people will respect this dignity um, of others and not harass or degrade others. So that's just you know a little bit of, um, just to give you a glimpse of uh, what I'm talking about. And then finally, I'd like to bring up the external oversight board. For those of you who don't know what Facebook's external oversight board, it is a independent external body um, of experts that will revise um, content um, decisions that are made by Facebook. And the decision by that external oversight board will be binding on Facebook, meaning that Facebook will not be able to reverse that. The process uh, through which this oversight board has been established is a beautiful one. Um, the company has been consultating with experts um, for a little bit over a year now. Um, it's been extremely transparent. I know that a lot of you who are here today have been part of that process. Um, and hopefully towards, as we enter 2020, we'll be able to have the board operationally working on concrete cases, and hopefully those decisions um, will also help us guide and improve our internal policies. This is unprecedented in the industry, and um, I'm extremely proud to be able to be part of this work, and i um, looking forward to see how that's uh, playing out in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Um, so we'll take just two questions uh, before we move on to the next one over there. Yes, uh, you have the microphone. Hi, I was wondering, uh, I, I hope you know that Microsoft has something called transparency centers. So that means that trusted, uh, trusted partners, I think there's seven trusted partners, the EU is one, uh, can go to five centers, I think one's in Brussels, one's in Singapore, and really see what's actually happening. Will Facebook be doing something like this? Will this become a standard in the industry? Uh, the gentleman next to you. Thank you very much. For um, Facebook, you mentioned that freedom of expression um, principles underline, underlie all of your moderation guidelines and policies. Could you say which freedom of expression principles? Are these uh, under the Universal Declaration? Are they under regional human rights instruments, such as the Organization of American States uh, or the European Convention on Human Rights? And could you comment on the difference among those standards if you, if you, um, if you have any views on that? Okay, I've seen another hand, so I'll take a, another quick one. Qu question for Nick. I'm Steve Dalbianco of NetChoice, and I haven't read your entire work yet, uh, but I take note of your two avenues for collaboration. The first being to uh, translate the values into concrete rules. The second was to hold platforms to account. But I would encourage you, if you've listened to the discussions that occurred in the main room earlier today, platforms themselves face an existential risk of disappearing if they are held liable for the things that we see, do, say, and sell on platforms. And we heard a few speakers in the anti-terrorism session talk about that. So the, the civil society that values the ability to do free expression on platforms probably has to help avoid having those platforms suddenly become directly liable for government action and for civil lawsuits for the things we do and say. Thank you. you Monica, I think. Hi, so um, on the first question, I'm not familiar with Microsoft um, um, uh, program or process that you mentioned, so I'm unable to speak to it. Um, we can follow up. Um, also on the on the freedom of expression um, principles, I don't think I have time. Nico is looking fiercely at me across the table to go into detail, but um, we can definitely follow up um, as well offline. Um, happy to connect you with some people who are working specifically on these standards. Um, but what I meant is. Um, the company will always err on the side of free speech, but there are, of course, um, there are um, spaces in which, if we want to pre preserve the safety of our users, in which we will need to, the company will need to uh, put some limits, uh, such as, you know, um, any kind of expression that might lead to 
um, you know, real world harm or even bullying or harassment. Um, and these are, you know, really standards to, uh, difficult standards to, um, to find the, the exact right balance. But um, we always look at those and try to work um, on those areas, taking into account that free speech and free expression is in the DNA of the company, and we're always having that as our, you know, um, uh, main goal for sure. Nick, did you want to answer? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, and I, I agree um, wholeheartedly that. Uh, limitations on liability are fundamentally important to promoting freedom of speech and the, the viability of the platforms that we uh, rely on. I think one of the key challenges is that the lack of legitimacy in how platforms have made decisions about setting and enforcing their rules to date has led to all of the pressure to carve out or in, uh, the safe harbours and impose more liability. So I think that the answer is that we have to do both, that we have to keep advocating for strong intermediary liability protection rules and clear and um, clear and effective rules for when platforms have to take action uh, according to law, but also the trade-off then is that platforms need to invest more and we need to uh, help them do that to make their internal decision-making processes more efficient in order to increase trust and legitimacy. Edison, do you want to come? Yeah, I, I totally agree with the, the previous intervention and, and say I'm, uh, I've forgotten to to say that the, the, the special rapporteur recommend that the platform adopted the international law in regards to freedom of expression. And this mind that uh, adopted the, the test of necess necessity and, and proportionality in the, in the decisions, um, you know, um, redact in, in, in more narrow way the terms of condition. And, and, and finally, I, I, we understand that uh, we need a, a, a you know a period to adapt adapt the the, the decision and, and the capacity building inside the, the companies because in this uh, you know I participated in, in Mexico in, in one of these uh, consulting and and we discuss some decision that the companies take before uh, in in one internal and and we agree in this uh, uh, this meeting that the, the company have a lack of uh, you know. Um, capacities to adopt this kind of, of uh, international law. Uh, and finally, this, this is the idea that uh, the self-regulation, the regulation of the state and the, the policies that uh, improve, uh, you know, the, the, the content moderation and, and make, make more, more transparency, uh, go and, and align finally with the, the international principle of freedom of expression that uh, I, there, are, there are some consensus about, uh, you know, the, that what this means, no? Okay, now that we move to the second segment of the session, I would like to ask to the panelists to have short and sharp uh, presentations so that we can move uh, expeditiously, not really expeditiously, but uh, in a way that guarantees we also, all also reach the third segment of the session we have time. So platform values and, uh, con and mo content moderation is the second segment, analyzing how, uh, what is the impact of both algorithmic and uh, handmade uh, by moderators, uh, moderation on uh, people's ability to uh, share information, uh, receive information, but also on uh, companies, on businesses, and rely of, on visibility uh, for uh, their business model, like uh, journals. So first, uh, let's start with Chris Marsden from Sussex University, uh, also to uh, provide some, some insight uh, on their contribution on what is the impact of content moderation on election. So uh, thank you for the invitation, Luca and Nico, and thanks for all that you do. I know how, how hard it is to get this together. And to get this particular monumental special issue together was fantastic. It's not paginated, so my article is about just over halfway through. Um, and I'll mention the co-authors in a second. First of all, I just have to note, um, in the United Kingdom, there is a national professor's strike taking place this week and next week. Were I in the United Kingdom, I would be on strike. So I want to acknowledge that and acknowledge my colleagues who are on the picket lines today on rather a cold, miserable day in the UK. Uh, and uh, if you want to hear more about that, ping me an email and there will be an extensive auto-reply that will tell you about it. 
so I want to note uh, the article is called Platform Values and Democratic Elections, How Can the Law Regulate Digital Disinformation? We know obviously about the thanks that uh, presidents uh, such as Bolsonaro owe to Facebook, uh, Prime Minister Modi and others. Uh, and so this is obviously a very critical issue for us going forward to see the way in which platforms are being abused in order to spread uh, disinformation. Uh, my co-author is Atricia Meyer from the Free University of Brussels and Ian Brown, uh, who is uh, both a visiting uh, professor at FGV in Rio and also at uh, Research ICT Africa. Ian, you will note, has put his name last on the article, which not only reflects the fact that he is a wonderful collaborator, but also that this is primarily work that Trisha and I were doing as part of a report for the European Parliament, uh, which, uh, which came out last year, although this work continues with the Commonwealth. So very quickly, uh, the article examines how governments can regulate the values of social media companies, such as Facebook, uh, that regulate code. In effect, they themselves regulate the disinformation spread on their own platforms. Uh, we use disinformation to refer to motivated faking of news, just so we have a definition here. And we examine the effects that the, di that the disinformation initiatives of these platforms have on freedom of expression, defined under Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which is very different to the First Amendment to the uh, United States Constitution, which, of course, Facebook uses its guiding principle, uh, media pluralism and the exercise of democracy from the wider lens of tackling illegal content online, and there are concerns that have been made uh, about the uh, requests for proactive automated measures uh, to remove content by online intermediaries, and I note that. Um, we also very, very specifically look at the automated decision-making systems that these platforms are deploying using artificial intelligence to cope with the scale of contents being shared. Uh, and let's note, we are talking about billions of accounts and many billions of comments. So we have a real danger that the machine is driving uh, decision-making. I'm going to skip directly, despite the deliciousness of Section 4, which looks at six potential options for regulation, to the conclusions, because it's there that we're shaped by the comments that were made uh, when we were drafting our articles by Luca and Nico, saying we want you to look at these very specific things. So I will explain very, very briefly these uh, very specific things. So we conceptualize the value dimensions that we're dealing with here as the protection of representative and electoral democracy. And we acknowledge that the size of the economic actors involved who are vast, existential threats matter less when you're a billion dollar company. Uh, mean that the economic value creation is affected by their regulation, but we maintain that issues concerning democratic and social values are paramount over the economic health of individual companies. Uh, and we accept that pay public choice theory theorizes that public, uh, politicians will mundanely pursue their self-interested course and the conduct of elections is their primary concern. And given that distinction between electoral regulation and all other forms of public policy, we find it unsurprising that electoral reform is central to the concerns of politicians. So politicians make electoral law after winning elections. Let's remember that. Uh, we caution that elections are conducted in a multimedia environment that varies by nation, that is converging on digital media, but that, that existing forms of media still predominate. So we don't maintain that online is the only form. And in the last minute, uh, a set of, of important questions put by Luca and Nico concerns what kind of institutions and regulatory tools can I identify, protect, and uphold the policy values in electoral regulation, uh, process and me mechanisms to restore democratic values and social justice uh, are important and in particular forms of human-centered co-regulation. So we do not propose self-regulation. We think self-regulation as a ship has sailed, has failed. We maintain co-regulation is required in order to ensure that the companies actually maintain transparency instead of asking them as to, re to uh, trust that they have a really binding forms of self-organization. And so very finally, to what entities do we apply rules based on specific values? Who should be the recipients of the regulation aimed at fostering the values that we choose and protecting the value that we create? And the answer may, of course, be individuals, who are the people who spread disinformation, but also the social media platforms and the electoral system itself, which is a socio-technical system. It is not merely a technical system. It is the deployment of technology. And we urge historical context. Disinformation is as old as the written world, uh, word, and we explain in section two that. It cannot be solved. Disinformation cannot be removed, but its worst effects can be somewhat ameliorated using the policy options that we outline in section four of the article, in particular that of co-regulation. 
And a final point to put this in a wider context. As with so many technological regulatory problems, from railways to nuclear power to the internet to artificial intelligence, the lessons of regulatory history are important to adapting existing and deploying new regula regulation for new technology. The complex socioeconomic deployment of innovations is what creates regulatory issues, not the technology itself. Thank you very context, much. Context, context, context. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I really urge uh, all the panelists to stick to the uh, five minutes maximum so that uh, we have also some time for discussion. Now, Ivar Hartmann, uh, who is coordinator of the Center for Technology and Society at FGV. Please, Ivar. Thank you, Luca. Let me join uh, Chris in acknowledging and thanking uh, your, uh, your and Nicholas' work on this special issue. Uh, my article is called New Framework for Online Content Moderation. And in the interest of time and the discussion here, I picked four topics that I'll briefly go over that I think are relevant for, the, for our panel. So what I'd like to propose is that we need to shift the focus of conversation about content moderation and platform responsibility in four ways. One is, uh, the talk about responsibility of platforms should be less about illegal speech that platforms fail to remove and more about legal speech that platforms illegally or unconstitutionally censor. In certain countries, law should be enacted to make clear that excessive censoring violates free speech and community standards as contractual clauses are in some instances abusive. In other countries, as is the case of Germany or Brazil, uh, the Constitution states that fundamental rights bind private parties either directly or indirectly. And so in such countries, courts could derive such obligation uh, directly from the Constitution and impose this obligation uh, to respect uh, free speech on private platforms. Second, uh, we should consider uh, a state regulation that is less about the merits of individual instances of speech and more about the protection of procedural rules. Uh, some people here in the panel have already talked about this. Uh, I think the best, uh, more uh, uh, latest example uh, of the way to go is the Santa Clara principles. Uh, so we need transparency about moderation practice, about specific removals and, and the opportunity to appeal. Platform liability in this sense needs to be for failures in terms of overarching procedure and moderation architecture and not for individual instances of speech. Third, um, this means that there is a previously unthinkable role for federal agencies to exercise oversight of platform compliance with basic procedural rules of moderation. Now, this is certainly a challenge to avoid influence of the executive branch of government in decisions on the merits of speech. But they are better equipped than courts to evaluate the use of machine decision-making tools in moderation, to evaluate the working conditions of content moderators around the world and the intricacies of platform architecture. And fourth, I believe we should stimulate less decisions on the merits of specific instances of speech by, platform, by platforms or courts, and more by users themselves. We need to separate the discussion of who makes the rules about what can and cannot be said, and um, the issue of who enforces from the issue of who enforces such rules. Platforms should no longer be alone in this effort, something that Facebook has already acknowledged with the establishment of the Independent Oversight Board. This is about user empowerment. There are no perfect answers in terms of speech. It is subjective, but it's better to have inclusive processes and processes that reflect local cultures, values, and realities. Thank you. Excellent, and thank you very much for respecting the time. You, you deserve the applause, <laughs> truly. So now, de how to democratize uh, online content moderation? Giovanni, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Luca. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank, of course, Luca and Nicola, as uh, all the other have already done, because this is a very important uh, moment for all of us to start, uh, to start and continue this talking about, you know, uh, what is the role and platform responsibility, especially during the last years. First of all, my paper, as has been presented, basically focuses on how we can democratize content moderation. 
And so first of all, and in order to do so, my paper tried to understand how the right to free speech that usually has been conceived from a negative perspective as, you know, as the right to not to be subject to interference for public, for, uh, from public actors now probably need to be recontextualized in the field of online platform in a positive dimension. So, so requiring basically state actors to intervene and then now we'll understand together how we can intervene in this field in the online content moderation just to protect the right to free speech. Because we know that, of course, the right to free speech is a fundamental value for our democratic society. So uh, this is important both, let's say, in the atomic environment and in the digital environment. But as we know, content online flows and are moderated by online platforms according to business purposes. So the moderation of content, the how content flow online is based on business purposes and is based on the, basically on profit maximization, but it's also user profiling and advertising coming from this profiling. So in this perspective, probably we should think about whether the right to free speech that basically is basically concerned with the threats coming from public actor from public actor is still enough in the information society to protect users and this is enough to protect democratic values online. And so what I try to argue in my paper is that probably we need to move from a negative to a positive dimension of the right to free speech online. And what does it mean moving from a po negative to a positive dimension? Basically requiring also and uh, rely on state actors on their positive obligation, if you look for example at the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, to intervene when there is a big threat for the protection of fundamental rights and human rights and in this case, online. And basically, well, well, the, um, this approach, this positive approach for freedom of expression leads basically to wonder what kind of regulation of content moderation we can try to draft and think about in the digital environment. I try to divide the process of content moderation in three main parts. The first part is the phase of notice that we can divide in two phases. The content notice, so basically where platform explain to users how the process of content moderations, basically uh, what are the criteria, and also uh, as has been uh, already said during the, some question in these panels, basically what kind probably of legal standards platform use when they moderate content. So basically this is something that is required ex ante to the platforms in order to allow users even to understand how they mod their content are moderated, first of all. And second, there is the second phase. So when platform really moderate content ex post, after receiving user notice, uh, um, of course based on their notion of awareness. And of course, the second phase after the notice that of course includes content provider, the notice provider, so platforms should be in some way uh, be also required to uh, give notice about what is happening, when a content has been signaled, has been flagged, and so forth. The second phase concerns especially decision making. So what happens after the user notice and of course, uh, what kind of safeguards can be implemented in content moderation, especially since content moderation is usually performed by using automated decision-making processes. And the last point basically concerns redress mechanism. What happens after having receiving the outcome of content moderation? What user can do after basically having, refu having received a decision coming from the online platform? And at which condition user can access this redress mechanism? But all this kind of content moderation, in my opinion, should be based on a list for principle, and basically I'm almost finished. And these four principles should be, of course, one, the first principle is very important is the respect of the ban of general monitoring. So platform will not, should not be required to monitor content, of course. But on the second way, this is, does not, of course, involve uh, amending the liability of online platform, but just requiring transparency and accountability in content moderation. So users should be more aware of what happens in what happens when uh, content flows online in social media lands in the social media landscape. But of course, this should also include proportionality for platforms because you know that sometimes regulation could also undermine small platforms and can constitute a barrier, a legal barrier to enter in the social media market of course for other small platforms. And last but not least, sometimes it's important also to focus on the role of human, of human in the loop also in content moderation, taking some clues and some, you know, some perspective from the field of data protection. And that's it.
Thanks. Thank you very much. And let me also uh, add a little comment on what you were saying about the implementation of a right to an effective remedy. In this special issue and also on the IGF website, you will find the best practices uh, with regard to the platform implementation of the right to an effective remedy that we elaborated collectively last year uh, over the time of one year, an entire year of consultation. And then we have both included here and on the website of the IGF, it's freely available for any platform willing to have guidance on how to implement the right to an effective remedy properly. Uh, now, uh, something very important is that the, those that, that are affected by moderation are not only individuals, are also businesses, and especially journalists and uh, media outlets. So I would like to ask to Dragana that I, I don't see Okay, sorry, you were <laughs> hidden there. So thank you very much, Rogana, for being with us and for sharing some uh, insights on how platforms are affecting your uh, work and your life. Yes. Well, thank you for the invitation. My name is Dragana Obradovic, and I'm coming from Balkan Investigative Reporting Network from Serbia. As you can uh, conclude from the name, uh, we are investigative journalistic uh, portal. So I will address basically this topic from the consequences that we are facing in our everyday they work, um, and that are not small. So we are speaking about uh, the conditions in which uh, we are working. This is like, uh, I would say, uh, without functional democracy, meaning without the institutions that will protect us, without functional judiciary, uh, but also without functional media market uh, and uh, with a full capture of, uh, of mainstream media. So that basically for us means that the internet is the only free space in which we can uh, promote our content and basically uh, inform thousands of our readers about the corruption, about the organized crime, about the misuse of position. Uh, and basically we all know that today internet means platforms like for my generation, uh, internet is Google for my son's generation that's YouTube for those in between probably Facebook uh, so that means that we are very dependent um, on the platform's policies and also very vulnerable to all the changes that are happening that are happening to them and I will just briefly mention two examples that can illustrate that kind of dependency like in 2007 Facebook um, basically introduced special feature that was called uh, Explore Feed. Uh, and that was introduced in several countries. Among those countries, that there was also Serbia. And that meant that all the media content is one click away from your regular feed. It was separated to, to another feed. And that, for us, meant like drop of 30% uh, of, of the traffic on our website. Um, fortunately, that practice was abandoned, like they decided the experiment was not successful. The other, um, uh, the other example that I will mention is more recent, and it is from the last month, basically, uh, when we published uh, a story about a high-level corruption that was happening in Serbia. Um, that was the story about a high-ranked official uh, that was followed by the video, and we were informed uh, by YouTube that the video will be removed, like taken down, based on privacy complaint. Without the information, like who complained, over what exactly, we got like 48, 48 hours notice uh, to fix the content, although we were not said like what exactly is wrong with it. So we reported back to YouTube, explained that it is in public interest and tried to defend our case. Nevertheless, uh, content was taken down. We managed to, to get it back online uh, only eight days later, which in media business is quite late, um, you will probably understand. So these are some examples that can illustrate like this kind of vulnerability that we have um, on algorithms and, and the rules and uh, basically experiments um, that we are subjected to and that we don't know enough of. But those that actually are taking advantage and benefiting from that are those that are having money. And that means in the case of Serbia, but I guess also other countries that are not fully democratic, that means governments, that means local tycoons, that means people that we are in fact reporting about. So they have enough money to pay like targeted ads, pay ads, to buy bots and services that, that are totally distorting uh, public discourse on social networks and basically are affecting uh, public opinions. So 
what is happening, it's happening that platforms are making profit from that. And at the same time, we are in the situation that we cannot even report these things to anyone because platforms that are making profit in our countries consider that they are too small markets to have their local representatives. So when something like that is happening to you, basically we'll send an email that will come back because you are sending it to the email that no one is uh, uh, checking. And we're speaking about the small country, I understand that's the, like the small market, but the fact is that the percentage of the people that are on social networks uh, is very high, like in the generation from 16 to 25 years old, like over 90% of young people are having uh, accounts on social networks. So as the end result of this situation is that journalists are primarily targets of online threats and harassments, and the second in a row are activists and human rights defenders that basically don't have the mechanism to defend themselves, and at the same time, those that are attacking us can easily pay to get you reported like a thousand times, and then your content is blocked and your profile is offline. So thank you. Thank you very much. And in the, in the interest of time management, I, all, I will only, only take one question so that we can then pass to the other segment. Do we have a quick question? Or otherwise, yes, please, the gentleman there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is YZ uh, from Nigeria. Uh, my question is actually um, to the discussant who has said um, self-regulation has failed and now we need to do co-regulation. And I'm wondering how do you do co-regulation in the context in which you are dealing with power and power differentials? and also access to resources. So how do you manage that in such a way that uh, civil society voices and weaker elements are not swamped down by other much more stronger elements in the core regulation uh, framework? Thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. I'm conscious the chair will insist. So um, we actually ran a workshop in September with, the, um, uh, with African members of the Commonwealth, including the Nigerian representative. And I'm conscious, um, people will be aware, two years ago in Kenya, the chief information security officer of the electoral regulator was murdered a week before the election. So this is a very real, very serious issue. Um, I think it reminds us that self-regulation is a joke when it comes to something quite as extreme and as that. It meant that they annulled the election in Kenya. Of course, they had to rerun the election. Uh, so co-regulation really does uh, two things. It makes sure that the uh, platform providers have to play ball because legislation is in place. They don't have an option of whether or not to be tr more transparent or to set up these nice centers. They have to do it. But the other thing is it gives the uh, government flexibility to be able to know that uh, they can rely upon technical expertise to, in to be inserted into the process. It's a multi-stakeholder thing. And so you can get independent experts, for instance, in universities and other places to actually assess what's going on inside what is, under self-regulation, the black box of these companies. So it's not perfect. It needs a lot of technical details. Some of us have worked a lot on the technical detail over uh, decades. But it's certainly a lot better than self-regulation. And it avoids some of the pitfalls of having regulation in place, which actually isn't aimed in the, in the right direction. So it's a hybrid. It's a compromise. It's not perfect. And th there's a book called Internet Co-Regulation talking about it, so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we move to the third part of the discussion. And um, here we have a number of um, papers that pointed out at how we can reconcile different values and uh, the difficulty of uh, basically balancing one value uh, with a different sort of value and uh, how platforms can create a framework that makes them accountable in that regard. So uh, we have two different sets of paper in this, as this part of the discussion goes. Uh, one has to do with, more with artificial intelligence and how the conflicting rights are balanced in that context. And the second part, uh, more with platformization more generally. So we start with the paper on um, artificial intelligence and uh, the combination of ethics and legal norms. Uh, so it's Professor Rolf Weber from University of Zurich. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Luca and uh, Nicola, for the invitation. 
I uh, would like uh, to address a topic uh, under the heading of conflicting rights and uh, values, not by summarizing my article, but by trying to use somehow uh, fresh uh, perspective. Let's start with the observation, at least as a lawyer, I'm very much used to try to solve conflicts uh, in uh, society. We heard about freedom of expression on the one hand, censorship, algorithmic intervention uh, into the flow of information on the other side. We do have the well-known discrepancy between property rights, right to aggregate, for example, collected data versus uh, privacy rights. We do have uh, a specific uh, provision now in Article 22, GDPR, on the way how automated uh, decision uh, making could uh, comply with data protection principles. This is in fact not a topic of my four uh, minutes, but uh, I would like uh, to uh, look more closely into the question how to reconcile legal rights, fundamental rights, with uh, economic and social values. And insofar I think we have to depart from the situation that data as such uh, is also a value and here um, we do have tension between uh, the person um, who builds a private data, a data um, silo based uh, on uh, collection of data on the one hand and the interest uh, of a larger society to uh, share data and uh, some other bridge between uh, these two situations can be seen in data access uh, rules and uh, data access rules in principle should lead to a balance uh, of uh, interests uh, based uh, on uh, balancing, interest balancing weighing test which uh, would uh, compare the rights of the data creator and the rights of the original um, holder um, of the data. Usually, um, if you look at the economic perspective, we of, co of course call upon the uh, competition law, which has not yet been mentioned uh, in uh, this uh, workshop. So a regulatory interference into the value process or a value change appears to be justified if the creator of the data is earning something like an economic rent, which exceeds the amount being adequate under economic and or social considerations following the exploitation of a first mover uh, position. This is uh, likely to happen in case of automated uh, platforms since the owner or controller often enjoys a market dominant uh, position. And uh, the higher the uh, market power is, uh, the higher should also be the responsibility of the respective uh, market participant, but uh, equally, uh, the more likely a uh, broad uh, data access rule could uh, counterweight the market dominant position of uh, the respective uh, creator of the data. This is one aspect. I mean, we did have in the past uh, quite uh, intensive discussions about uh, competition law. I cannot deepen that at this moment. And then I would like to look more at the ethical or socio-ethical dimension of the whole uh, problem. Uh, this uh, dimension would require the implementation of uh, new principles, partly already mentioned uh, during this uh, afternoon, certainly access and redress, but also accountability and auditability um, of uh, the uh, data uh, processes, including valid validation and uh, testing. We might have to consider to implement uh, new uh, instruments, for example, ethics uh, committees having an influence on uh, the uh, platform uh, owners on a national level, on an um, international level, and we might have to look uh, for a strengthening of human autonomy principles as well as uh, of fairness and trust principles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, in the interest of time, please refrain from thanking us again and uh, just proceed with the presentation. Uh, Catalina, uh, next. Catalina Gonta from Maastricht University. 
Okay, no thanks, I'll do that later. Um, so it is my pleasure to present to you uh, the paper that I've written with Sofia Ranchurdas uh, at the University of Groningen called The New City Regulators, Platform and Public Values in Smart and Sharing Cities. I'll present this in three very brief acts. First of all, moving everybody's attention from the content moderation that we discussed in social media platforms to the actual physical realities of a city. Um, so that's a, a space that has been actually historically uh, affected by privatization so a lot of companies operating, but now it's also a lot of internet platforms operating there. A very good example, just for you to understand the issue of uh, all of these uh, public and, and actually <laughs> local values that come at play here. In the city of Munich, earlier this year, um, someone at the municipality received a call two days before Lyme came with a fleet of 12,000 e-scooters in the city. And then they just had to deal with whatever happened out of that. This is the first point. So um, uh, the privatization of the public space, uh, space with, uh, with platforms. The second point is what is the state of the art when it comes to the local values that can be mentioned in this situation? Um, it's very difficult to really pinpoint at what values we're talking about for two particular reasons. On the first hand, because uh, if you're speaking about municipalities, everything is very political. So uh, a lot of values are expressed in terms of uh, a very electoral discourse course narrative uh, uh, method. And then also with platforms, um, one thing you see on the in their general terms and conditions and another thing you see in their marketing. So uh, for instance, with Lime, my example for today, um, you can see that they really advertise simple and accessible mobility. Then if you look at their general terms and conditions, they actually have a, um, a, a liability waiver that even covers public authorities. So Lime even says, we're not liable for whatever happens if you use our service, but even our public authorities that we signed contracts with are not liable either. So that's very, very interesting. There's a lot of uh, controversy there. Um, so, and then the, the idea is that it's very difficult to really pinpoint at these kind of values. We try to do so in the paper, so more on that there. Um, but uh, there are also clearly some values that are very similar. So as we heard uh, earlier on, safety is a value that no um, micromobility company is going to say they're not backing up because they are definitely very interested in that as well. Now, what can we do about the conflict between public values and then local values? Uh, in the paper, we have uh, some daring proposals also to build on what Chris was mentioning earlier, the idea of co-regulation. Um, I think that, uh, and also to build on one of the questions that we heard earlier, co-regulation maybe hasn't worked that much because of a lack of a framework for that. So an example, a very clear, concrete example of what we say in the paper is, why don't municipalities have an obligation, uh, impose a legal framework, for instance, instance, for platforms to negotiate in good faith the way in which their services are going to be deployed on the streets of a city like Munich. Second of all, uh, co-regulation is not just about substantive rights, but it's also about enforcement. And that's very important to keep in mind. Bruce Schneier is, um, and his work we build on in the paper, uh, he has this amazing concept of public interest technology, which I think encapsulates the need of uh, creating more interaction also in, in, in terms of enforcement. Um, Jose van Dijk, who's also present, uh, who has an article in this special issue, has written a lot about the, the, the co-regulation of uh, Amsterdam Amsterdam, the, the city of Amsterdam and um, uh, Airbnb and the fact that that has actually failed simply because um, on the one hand Amsterdam really needed uh, to be able to get the um, the data infrastructure from Airbnb, and on the other hand, Airbnb didn't really need the municipality. So uh, these are two ideas that we put forth in the um, in the article, and uh, of course that I think that they can always be uh, uh, built upon, especially with different um, contexts, like for instance social media. So this was the story that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, short and crisp. Um, now. Uh, concretely how to balance different values in a dispute resolution process. This is a thing that comes up more and more, and uh, we have an excellent paper by Isolt Marike and Engeron Marike, correct me if I mispronounce it. Um, so we would like to hear a bit more about your proposal. Thank you very much for the invitation. So when we see the complexity uh, underlying conflicting values, it, we see we think that it's very ambitious just to offer one-size-fits-all solution, and that 
a way to move forward might be to look at more specific decision tools to factor this contextual and particular consideration in the decision taken by digital operators. So what we try to do is uh, doing, um, going into three steps from the more general approach, more contextual approach to the more specific ones. And we mentioned already a few times in the first step that it's important to reflect on the unique role played by platform operators when they withdraw or block contents and similar uh, action, because for us, we think that uh, their role is mostly to be a warden on the modern public square, on uh, protecting some, in some ways, uh, democratic values to, when they police uh, invisible behavior on the platforms. So we can see that there might be some blurring between uh, a public and a private role uh, that um, platform op operators uh, play. So in the second step, we think that it's important to give a legal label because we, we often talk about the different actions, that's true, but we should also, as lawyers, and we are lawyers, to give a specific label to these actions. And we think that, legally speaking, these are sanctions. So they are the expression of powers taken by one agent, uh, the platform operator, on other agent platform users. And in law, in general, there are consequences attached to sanctions. We mentioned already uh, one big um, uh, consequence, which is proportionality, but we could think of other consequences, such as the predictability uh, or the need of a review mechanism. So in our paper, we looked at this uh, proportionality test uh, that has been discussed in, by other uh, authors, uh, but mostly looking at um, the relationship between the interference of an action with privacy on the one hand and uh, the interference with freedom of expression. And in the paper, we try to go a little bit uh, further in that proportionality test in pinpointing a few issues and questions uh, linked to the proportionality tests, such as can we really uh, break down the proportionality test in a quantitative operation, feeding it to an automatic decision-making process, and how can we try to uh, do the breaking down a little bit more specifically. When can uh, the proportionality test or should the proportionality test be used? And we have also a big question that maybe some of you may have uh, input about is that it's very good to think about the proportionality test, but is it is it not going to become too individualistic approach on the life on the internet? And how do we account for a more collective uh, aspect of the life on the internet? So um, we think that uh, we need to go back to the specific roles of platform operators uh, on this modern public square uh, to build <coughs> further. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so in, in order to have some discussion, um, I propose that we uh, leave um, the last word to uh, the publisher of this uh, special issue, uh, Catherine Carnaval uh, from Elsevier. Um, they have uh, been so kind to, because they also are a platform and they have to balance and take into account different values. Uh, they have uh, agreed to uh, give a few words about their policies in particular regard of, uh, with regard to artificial intelligence. And then we can open up the floor after that. I will be quick. My thanks to you both. Um, so as the publisher for Computer Law and Security Review, I'm very proud to represent the journal that's supporting the research that we're discussing here today. The journal has been a forerunner in this area, publishing legal analysis and policy development since 1985. When I first had about, heard about this special issue, it prompted me to think about Elsevier's responsibility as one of the largest publishers of scientific research in the world. The articles in this special issue have joined 16 million articles on Science Direct. And as the provider of that digital platform, we, Elsevier, bear a deep responsibility to our authors and our readers. We recognize that there is growing demand for open access with both, both practical and ideological motivations. And with that said, over 80% of our authors chose to publish under a subscription model last year. And we simultaneously see growth in both fields. And for this reason that we're dedicated to providing our researchers with choices on how they publish their articles. We recognize that different communities have different needs and we're open to piloting and testing new concepts which give fair value to all parties. We recognize that researchers in developing countries have different priorities. 18 years ago, Elsevier became a founding member of the Research for Life platform with the World Health Organization. And this platform is central to providing, is central to our goal to achieving universal access to information. It enhances scholarship, teaching and research of thousands of individuals and it reduces the knowledge gap between developing and industrialized countries. Our role within the community is changing. 
Elsevier has played a part in scholarly communication for 140 years, primarily as a publisher and now as an information analytics business. And we recognize the power of the knowledge that we hold. We employ technologists and data scientists to provide, to apply machine learning to reveal insights and make our content more actionable. In healthcare, we're developing clinical support application to utilize cognitive technologies to map patient data. We're committed to bringing transparency and rigor to our platforms, especially at a time where it, when it's hard to believe, to know what to believe. In the interest of time, I'll keep it there. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today and please pick up a copy of the special issue and I look forward to receiving your submissions in the future. So thank you very much to all. It's been an impressive set of presentation. Uh, I'm sure there's uh, some burning questions. Uh, probably you want uh, an author to clarify or go a little bit more in depth about uh, one of the topics. If there's uh, an end, I will give you the floor. Is there any hand up? Okay, if there's no clarificatory question, which you can address separately with the author indeed, I think it's perhaps uh, good to recognize, um, you know, we have tried to bring together very different contributions. And so what we would like to propose, you know, for moving forward in this discussion is to ask ourselves uh, three important questions. So the first is, what are the values? Do we have a common understanding? I think we have been talking about different sets of values. Um, are, are, do we have some minimum core, some understanding about what are the values that we want platforms to promote and what platforms in particular? The second is what are the best strategies to uh, ensure that digital platforms not only maximize uh, shareholder value but take into account the broader set of concerns you know, of societal players, so stakeholder value. And the third is um, to what extent are they, the platforms themselves, the best entities to identify what, what the values should be and uh, how they should be promoted? So this has come up with uh, regard to a couple of questions. Uh, to what extent uh, is self-regulation sufficient to deal with uh, certain sets of uh, value creation and preservation? Uh, to what extent uh, uh, top-down regulation is appropriate uh, and to what extent maybe a corrugatory framework is the solution. Uh, these are some of the questions that we wanted to put out for discussion uh, through this special issue, but of course also in the incoming year with the Dynamic Coalition, we hope to um, continue the discussion. Uh, if you um, are not a member already, you can join our mailing list and uh, we'll uh, we have some ideas about what could be the output for next year. Um, is there any question or suggestion with regard to uh, the Dynamic Coalition's work and how you would like to participate or see us uh, achieving a concrete output in the next year? Or even any suggestion of outcome and output that you would like a group of people working on platforms to work on uh, to propose something that could be concretely meaningful, both for platforms, for regulators, for users. Uh, we have been working for five years. We intend to work more. So if you have any suggestions on things that burning issues that you think uh, would benefit from people working on uh, existing or potential solutions, uh, don't be shy. And this is the time to uh, share with us your thought. Or you can also do it on, on the, our mail, mailing list. So I have a thought, but I may be abusing presenters' privilege. I'm just seeing if anyone else does. So three things. I think what Nick said about Santa Clara principles and how they are rewritten, I think, would be fascinating to be involved in. I know that you know open collaboration is encouraged there. Uh, second thing is the Digital Services Act, which presumably won't still have been passed in a year's time, but nevertheless, we have the new commission confirmed. Uh, and given that we will be we're in Warsaw next year, I believe, uh, so we will continue, I suppose, to have that European conversation. And the third thing is, disinformation is not about to go away. It's been kicking around for 10,000 years, so I presume it's not planning on being eliminated in the next year. And I think this will become a much, much, much bigger rather than smaller issue, sadly, over that year. Yes, indeed, I think the Digital Service Act is a very important uh, 
regulatory battle that we are going to see uh, unraveling over the next year. Uh, I should mention we had a meeting, an informal meeting of uh, Dynamic Coalition yesterday, and we thought that some concrete way of uh, um, shaping the uh, platform regulation and governance discussion is to uh, create some concrete and simple recommendations for policymakers, a sort of a handbook for regulators. And we could indeed focus the handbook on some specific topics like the ones you mentioned. I think that could be a good solution. I think it could be interesting to look at how can you get how can you um, deal with the negative impact of content moderation through non-content related regulations? Um, I think that's a challenge for us that we get away from some of the free speech issues. I would also note that neither of your mailing list links, neither the one on the website nor the one you sent me, Luca, are working. I, def I defer responsibility to the IGF secretariat who has been notified several times of, of our change of mailing list but has not updated the web page. So I, we will tweet the, right now the l correct link to subscribe to the mailing list. And, and I see there, is an, there was another lady there uh, willing to uh, say something yeah, you would, you, with the orange sweater, yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm Sana, I'm a researcher. I work at the Weizenbaum Institute for Network Society here in Berlin. Um, I'm researching on the outsourced model of content moderation and the business practices in India. Um, I think it would really help to actually unravel what a platform really is. And I'm sure that it's, it's more than technical infrastructure um, and how the, this sort of neutral, neutral category has allowed um, these businesses to sort of um, not allow for any transparency for that matter. So I think it would really help to unravel what a platform is in context, especially of these social um, networking sites. Thank you. So just to provide a quick reply to this, actually in, the, in our recommendations on terms of service and human rights, that was exactly the first question we had when we started to work five years ago. And actually in the recommendation, we define it as any application allowing to uh, in part, seek in part or receive information according to the terms of service unilaterally defined by the platform provider. So it's a very broad definition that encompasses almost everything from a blog to a social network to an e-commerce uh, vendor. Um, you may uh, propose to update it or to have something different if you want. We are always welcome to inputs and positive or negative critiques on what we do. So well, very welcome to, to provide your feedback on this. And indeed, if I may add, there will definitely be um a chapter, a part of the handbook that will focus on the definition of platform. So that's an essential term, like other terms, like uh, what does it mean to be neutral? Uh, you know, some uh, myth busting that I think uh, the IGF has uh, nicely done in this uh, book that we have all received. I mean, that's something that we would like to also deal with in the context of platform specifically. Um, we have another question over there. Uh, first, one. Uh, well, only one sentence. I think being involved in the group, we have to force ourselves to uh, work more in an interdisciplinary way. We haven't done so very much in the past, but we should do more. Well noted. Please. Thank you, Steve Dabianco. Question about your definition of platform. Uh, Catalina's article talked about the scooter companies, and that is a completely different notion of platform. That isn't a peer-to-peer -peer sharing where you're sharing your scooters with others. It's a company that owns the scooters and puts them in place. So it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not about